This is Radio Ukraine International with the weekly program Doing Business, hosted by me, Rodion Drzeznyavsky, and produced by Irina Samsonova. Doing Business covers current economic developments in and concerning Ukraine and gives topical information as well as immediate and longer-term economic forecasts. It is what we think might give you food for thought and help you see Ukraine from the economic angle. During President Zelensky's visit to London in October 2020, Ukraine and the UK signed an agreement on political cooperation, free trade and strategic partnership replacing the previous association agreement on post-Brexit trade. Signing the document for the UK, Prime Minister Boris Johnson described it as historic, which means more trade, more security and more interaction between the UK and Ukraine. The two flanks of Europe, Western and Eastern, became even closer. The agreement was ratified by the Ukrainian parliament in December and took effect on the 1st of January. The document provides for the gradual creation of a free trade area between the United Kingdom and Ukraine, in accordance with the agreed timetable for the abolition of import duties. Starting from 2023, 100% of Ukraine's industrial and agricultural products will be exempted from import duties. That will facilitate Ukrainian companies' entry into the UK market. The agreement will also create more economic incentives for Ukrainian producers and attract more investment to this country, while the UK has fair chances to become a major sales market for Ukrainian goods. Among other things, the agreement identifies the areas of cooperation and provides for holding meetings of the Trade Committee, which will include representatives of both parties. London estimates the current trade turnover with Ukraine at one and a half billion pounds. Along with the free trade agreement, the sides signed a memorandum providing for the Ukrainian Navy's re-equipment and joint production of missile boats. The first two hulls will be built at a British shipyard with the participation of specialists from a Ukrainian manufacturer. In the future, the entire production process, from assembling hulls to equipping ships with weapons, will take place in Ukraine at a shipyard to be chosen by the two parties. The British Embassy's press department said in a commentary, UK Ambassador to Ukraine Melinda Simmons kindly answered my questions covering these topics. The free trade agreement between Ukraine and the UK, which was signed during President Zelensky's visit to London in October last year, took effect on the 1st of January. What market access opportunities does it open for Ukrainian companies? So I think the main point about the uh, strategic partnership agreement is that it was negotiated when the UK was still a member of the EU. And therefore, it was negotiated on the basis of the EU's association agreement with Ukraine, which is a good agreement which gave um, Ukrainian companies zero tariff, right? So at the moment, that means that the shift to a bilateral agreement makes no change. The vast majority of Ukrainian goods enter the UK at low or zero tariffs. I think one difference, one exception, if you like, which uh, will be the subject of discussion in the course of this year now that we've left the EU, is that there are some tariffs or quotas on some goods which are important to Ukraine, and that includes some agricultural products. Mm. But um, we have negotiating an implementation mechanism for the trade agreement in which we're able to talk through that with Ukraine's Department of Trade. And those talks have been really constructive. So I think this year is going to be about looking at those exceptions and seeing what we can do. What areas of economic cooperation with Ukraine is the UK primarily interested in? Well, I think the interesting thing actually about the UK-Ukraine trade relationship is that those exports have always covered a really wide range of areas. And I'm not sure that's going to change. So we have interest, for example, in exporting Scotch whiskey. We also uh, are interested in exporting civil aircraft. Um, we have a very good comparative advantage in the export of pharmaceuticals. The prospects are there actually across quite a diverse range of sectors. For now, I think our prior- most immediate priorities are likely to focus on agricultural technology, where we already have a history with Ukraine, and we're interested in building that. Food and drink, obviously. Infrastructure, defence and security, you'll have seen, and I'm sure we'll come to talk about this later, the agreement that was signed on naval capacity building is based on quite a strong historical capability there by the UK, and also civil nuclear and uh, the tech sector, where Ukraine, I think, really has a strong comparative advantage. Had the pandemic affected bilateral trade? Well, yes, it has. You know, I trade between the two dropped by about 20% last year. 
which is not something anyone would have wanted. And actually, if you look at the figures, Ukraine, the balance of exports favoured the UK a bit more than it favoured Ukraine, but actually it was fairly equal. But it's not a drop either a country would have wanted to see. And what we all hope, obviously, is that along with other economic impacts, it's temporary. So uh, this isn't about businesses deciding they didn't want to invest or trade with Ukraine or the other way. It's only about the restrictions on travel and on which meant that it similarly restricted imports and exports. So that has been an inevitable consequence and something that we, along with many other countries where that will have been affected, uh, will be looking to redress this year and next year. What are the main points of the program for the development of shipbuilding and construction of port infrastructure? The UK is a country surrounded by water, right, which means that we've got a really good history as a naval country. Uh, Naval service is one of the best, loads of, of experience. So when President Zelensky visited the UK, there was a memorandum of intent that was signed between the Secretary of State for Defence and uh, the Defence Minister Andrew Taran to look to see how the UK could help build Ukraine's naval mm-hmm. capacity on its own experience. And uh, not just um, training experience, but also potentially on port infrastructure where uh, Ukrainian ports are in need of that updating, modernising, where the UK can help. And on uh, shipbuilding, potentially sale of ships and technology transfer really on those areas. The agreement on strategic partnership provides for a simplified visa regime. The president of Ukraine has extended for another year the visa-free regime for your citizens. Does the UK, for its part, plan to make life easier for Ukrainian applicants for a UK visa? So I think the important thing to remember about visas is that when the EU negotiated its visa-free regime with Ukraine, the UK was not inside Schengen, the Schengen Agreement, on which that visa-free regime was predicated and uh, never has been. The main reason why it has not been is because of border security concerns and those border security concerns remain. So the question of whether and how and if uh, the visa regime for Ukraine to UK changes depends pretty much on progress that is made in managing those border security concerns, which come, you know, derived from illegal smuggling, trafficking of people, um, fraudulent documents, etc., And uh, what was great about when the president went to London was that Minister Avakov also came and he had his first conversation with our Interior Minister, Priti Patel. It was really great that they had that conversation. Again, this is a casualty of COVID. The pandemic then made it impossible to do what they wanted to do, which was a visit exchange whereby Home Office officials from the UK could have conversations with officials here in, uh, in Ukraine about border security and start to assess um, measures that Ukraine was taking. That hasn't been able to happen. But I really hope that along with other things that um, the arrival of vaccines will help to change, that conversation can continue. Are there any privileges in obtaining visas for Ukrainian business people and for young people who want to study in your country? Well, there is a fantastic scheme which the uh, British government sponsors, which is called the Achievement Programme, mm-hmm. which is um, full scholarships, actually for people who are assessed as having leadership potential to pursue a master's degree. So it's not a universal scheme for all students. Um, It's it's a selective scheme. And uh, if you are granted one of those scholarships, it covers university fees, living expenses, and it uh, also covers visas and the cost of travel. So it is a brilliant scheme. It's also the case that in Eastern Europe, Ukraine is the biggest beneficiary of that scheme. That, of course, is because Ukraine has got loads of really great um, people with leadership potential and who are interested in pursuing further education in the UK. It's an exciting scheme because the take-up is very diverse. People pursue a very diverse range of studies. And so through that way, really, um, if people want to pursue that scheme, that is a way in which one can um, travel to the UK and receive assistance with visa. How would you assess the potential of the Ukrainian market? Oh, gosh, I think it's huge. I really do. I've only I've been here less than two years, but I still uh, I think the potential is huge in terms of the scale of the country, in terms of the entrepreneurial nature of the country, I think it's all there. And I know that um, British investors also see that opportunity. In terms of whether the UK might want to up its game, if you like, in Ukraine, I mentioned uh, agritech earlier, and that is a really big potential sector for us. I think that's an area where the UK could do a lot better. Probably also the same for high-end consumer goods, also for cars. I think for, uh, as I was saying before, there are some regulatory barriers and some technical barriers that we need to resolve if we're to expand further, for example, into pharmaceuticals, into food and drink. But uh, as I said again before, Department of Trade in Ukraine has been really constructive in having those conversations. And as a result, 
we've actually seen some good progress. So, for example, Scottish salmon is now entering the Ukrainian market, which is obviously that's a high end food product, which is great to see that it's being made available in Ukraine. Have British businesses felt improvements in Ukraine's investment climate in recent years? So it's a really good question. I haven't seen, uh, and I don't think there is, specific data for British businesses. I have mm-hmm. seen polling that's done of businesses in general, which of course includes British businesses, about their experience uh, in working inside Ukraine. And what that throws up is something that sadly is not really a surprise, um, which is that corruption remains a major concern for companies that are operating inside Ukraine. If we take it on a kind of ad hoc, like an anecdotal story, when I talk to British businesses, they say that they're able to operate. So it's not that, you know, it's impossible to be here. They uh, they understand uh, how to operate. It's not that difficult for them to be able to go about their business. The main problem is that regulations can be arbitrary. And if they find that they're having to um, go to the courts or they're involved in any legal process, there is uh, the law doesn't have their back. And I see that for me as the flip side of the potential. The potential in Ukraine is enormous. The uh, barriers to it are just as significant. This is Radio Ukraine's weekly program Doing Business, and we continue our interview with UK ambassador to Ukraine, Melinda Simons. There are quite a few British companies in Ukraine like Shell, GSK or Vodafone, as well as smaller companies working in the energy, agricultural and pharmaceutical sectors. How comfortable do they feel in this country? I can't speak personally for them. Obviously, you would need to talk to them directly to find out how they're feeling. But um, we do, I do talk with businesses generally um, quite regularly. And I would say that overall it's quite a picture because, as I said before, investors that are present in the country are doing all right, but they do find themselves having issues where they're having to work through legal processes. And, uh, of course, they all talk to each other. And potential investors talk to existing investors. And I think that that picture can put people off deciding that Ukraine is a good market. So for all the potential, the problem is not whether they can enter the market. I actually think that Ukraine's doing a really good job at uh, Ukraine Invest, for example, is uh, really upping its game in helping companies to resolve um, regulatory issues when they're setting up. So setting up is becoming easier, but being here, establishing a comparative advantage and doing business is still subjecting companies to risks that I'm not sure new companies think that those risks are worth taking given this problem with lack of judicial reform. Are British investors interested in the privatization process in Ukraine? Well, privatization is something we know a lot about because uh, the UK was one of the first countries to go about doing it as far back as the 1970s. And that makes us actually quite well placed to advise Ukraine on privatization. And indeed, we do, including through a new um, World Bank program, which focuses on public-private partnerships, So, uh, which is something where we really know a lot. Of course, we're interested, but we're also ready to help. In your blog, you wrote that UK export finance had entered the Ukrainian market. So I think it's quite important to make clear that the job of uh, UK export finance is there to support British exports around the world. It's not a facility that helps Ukrainian Mm -hmm. exporters. What it does is it offers a range of financial products, so loans, insurance products, guarantees to British exporters. And what that means for Ukrainian business is that it can lend to any Ukrainian buyer, whether it's government or whether it's private, doesn't matter, any Ukrainian buyer of British goods or services. So what that means is that it's enabling Ukrainians to have more access to British expertise or to uh, any form of British production that Ukraine Ukrainians might feel they need as a component or in whole for, uh, for anything that they want to, for any piece of business that they want to do. What important changes have you noticed in Ukraine? I mean, positive and negative ones. I think there are probably two, and they're actually quite recent, I think. Mm-hmm. I think that government's increased confidence in standing up to Russian aggression is an important one, a really important one, because it shows an intent to strengthen sovereignty and to take actions on things that, that really weaken the state. And by that, I'm not actually necessarily talking about military. Um, think having in mind, of course, the recent military buildup. I'm talking about massive disinformation campaigns and the eroding of business, for example, uh, through convoluted business interests that are uh, brought in by pro-Russian supporters. And I see real measures that the president is taking to address those. Um, and um, 
I think it's higher risk, but I think that's kind of what this country needs is to look at higher risk uh, activity. Of course, any government is going to have to be judging all the time how to manage the consequences of that. One may even argue, and in social media, it has been argued that uh, the president's increased confidence in that area. That confidence is important for the country. The other thing I think is important is the uh, recent actions on judicial reform. Any action that uh, addresses the barriers to equal access to independent anti-corruption mechanisms and uh, transparently judged uh, legal mechanisms, these are the biggest issues if Ukraine wants to become a strong economic country. Becoming economically strong also means you become politically strong. So for me, these actions that the government are taking, they're linked. What the government does on security and what the government does on economic development, these things are linked. And those, of course, are watched by people who want to invest in the country, but also by all of us who are allies of Ukraine and really, really want to help Ukraine. Had you been to Ukraine before your appointment? I only was here once before, actually, for the job that I was doing before I became ambassador, um, because I oversaw the uh, Conflict Stability and Security Fund in the UK, and Ukraine was one of the biggest beneficiaries of that fund. So I came to Kiev. It was only Kiev at the time, for the first time, to uh, assess those programs. And then, of course, I came again before, actually, just thinking about it, before I took up my job on language training, and I moved in with a Ukrainian family and um, for a couple of weeks, and I studied advanced Ukrainian in uh, Kiev city centre. And both of these were eye-opening um, moments for me. But of course, uh, I have history here as my mother's family originally came from Ukraine. So this was always going to mean a bit more for me to get to know this country. Have you found any relatives here? No, the, it's important to understand. So my entire family roots from Eastern Europe. My entire family comes collectively from Ukraine, from Lithuania and from Poland. Mm-hmm. And they all left the region as refugees. So uh, in Ukraine, no, uh, uh, no exception. My great-great-grandparents left this country as refugees at the end of the 19th century, so around 1894-95, and there is no record of uh, relatives who stayed here having survived. So that means that it is very likely that they were Holocaust victims. And actually, recently, I did uncover a piece of evidence that suggested that relatives of mine had been killed in uh, Kharkiv in the Second World War. So uh, there is no other there is no other history. It's a refugee history. Do you travel around Ukraine? What places have impressed you the most? I wish I could travel more, of course. The pandemic has made that difficult. Um, and I cannot wait, really, to be able to get back to it. But even with the pandemic, I've still been able to travel a bit. So inevitably, the region I've been to most often is the east of the country. I've been there five times since I took up the job including going as far as the contact lines. So I went to Avdiivka together with the G7 ambassadors and with the president. And any time I go east is a very difficult and very eye-opening look at the hardships that people who are living in, in the Donbass have to deal with. And uh, frankly, the level of challenge that the Ukrainian military is uh, equally having to deal with. So these are always interesting visits. But uh, it's equally important and really helpful to be traveling around central and east Ukraine. And uh, of course, I've been to Odessa, of course, I've been to Lviv. But my most recent visit was to Vinnytsia. And uh, that was a great visit because Vinnytsia is a district that is uh, has stayed committed to institutional reforms, really benefited from decentralization reform, has been taking forward equal access to services for its um, citizens. And at the same time, of course, has an inherent potential instability uh, on its border. So the combination of uh, issues just made it a really, really interesting place to be. And a real warmth from everybody that I met really didn't matter whether it was council officials, you know, business, civil society, um, rights activists, didn't matter. It was a city with a real energy and real warmth. So I really enjoyed it. But I've got quite a few other visits lined up. And particularly given um, the UK's presidency of COP26, which we're sharing with Italy, the big climate change conference. I'm very keen to um, visit Ivana Frankivsk and to go to Zakarpatia and have a look at the impacts of the warming of temperatures in Ukraine on those regions. I think in Ukraine, people think about floods and, you know, deforestation affecting their daily lives. But I don't think enough attention is given to what could be done about it. I'm really keen to visit those regions so that I can help to highlight what actions can be taken to uh, mitigate and manage those risks. How many Ukrainians live in the UK now? Well, it's not. So it's quite interesting because there are not that many um, Ukrainians in the UK and it's not that organized a diaspora. So 
mostly where I've met Ukrainians in the UK, and of course, again, I haven't traveled to the UK much because of the pandemic. So again, that's limited my ability to be able to engage with um, Ukrainians in the UK. But London and Midland cities are centres for them. And uh, I'm in touch quite closely with Ukrainian Institute and sort of cultural organisations and also churches where there is a strong presence and a strong engagement by Ukrainians. But I would not say that the Ukrainian diaspora is particularly organised around political issues, which is to say that they don't tend to seek with me a direct conversation about issues affecting this country. They do vote and feel strongly about what happens in Ukraine. But they don't tend to, just because of their numbers, focus on directly lobbying the government about it. That said, there is a very good parliamentary group for Ukraine in the UK who are very active. Many people here will know John Whittingdale, but there is a good chair of the all-party parliamentary group on Ukraine that makes sure that there is regular outreach between the British Parliament and uh, Ukrainian expats. And of course, there is a very active Ukrainian ambassador in the UK, Vadim Prostaiko, who used to be the foreign minister here, who has been fantastic at that outreach. So I actually think that that will increase our understanding of um, concerns and interests of Ukrainian expats, expats in the UK. This is Radio Ukraine's weekly program Doing Business, and we continue our interview with UK Ambassador to Ukraine, Melinda Simons. Are there any similar traits of character between the British and the Ukrainians? Gosh, that's a really interesting question. How do we differ? So I think probably the biggest difference is determined by the fact that Ukraine has been independent for a lot less time. So the UK, of course, has got these really um, solid institutions which have been have stood the test of several centuries. And therefore, there's a huge amount of respect for them. And that even, if you like, when things are most volatile, those institutions stand their ground and people have a fundamental trust that those institutions will have their back and see them through. In Ukraine, because Ukraine is a new country and because it has been threatened and its institutions undermined within that time as well as before that time, trust in those institutions is really low, which is why I have to keep coming back to that these reforms must go forward in order that that people do begin to trust the courts, trust law enforcement, etc. I do see high levels of trust here by Ukrainians in religious institutions and in the army, for example, but in institutions that provide those social services and all the range of services that you need to go about your civic life, that I think is the biggest difference. It's been exactly two years since you were appointed Her Majesty's Ambassador to Ukraine. My congratulations. Thank you. That's a really lovely thought. Thank you very much. I hadn't even realized it was two years since <laughs> yeah. the... So thank, thank you for reminding me of that. Thank you very much, Ms. Simmons, for clarifying many points of economic relations between our countries. We are looking forward to seeing you here in our studio again soon. In late January, President Zelensky decreed to extend the visa-free travel to Ukraine for UK citizens until January 30, 2022. These steps are supposed to not only attract new investors to Ukraine, but also enhance relations between the West and the East of Europe and generally strengthen Ukraine's position on the world stage. That was Radio Ukraine's weekly program Doing Business, hosted by me, Rodion Zhiznevsky, and produced by Irina Samsonova. Thanks for listening.